Welcome to the Virginia is for Laughers podcast brought to you by X2 Comedy. If you're looking to get more out of your Shenandoah Valley experience, then this is the podcast for you. You'll meet interesting people, musicians, and comedians that perform here and find out more about what you can do and see. Whether you live here or plan to visit, listen to explore what makes our unique slice of heaven. Now here's your host, Don Davis Womack. Hello, lovers. We're excited to welcome back to the show Letitia Bates, the driving force behind At The Wheel Coaching. She's a renowned coach, consultant, and author. The last time she was with us was episode number 41 to discuss the keys to reset on mindset with tips from number one Amazon bestselling book, I Can, 12 Keys to Achieve Personal Success in the Smartest Way. Her other accolades include Distinguished Toastmaster and the prestigious Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Leadership Award. Letitia truly brings a wealth of expertise and passion to her trauma-informed coaching and consulting practice, which is our focus today. She's here to bring you deep insights and helpful tips on becoming your best higher self by uncovering the hidden challenges that may be sabotaging your growth. Letitia's personal and professional journey is marked by a commitment to empowering individuals and organizations to navigate challenges with resilience and grace. Her diverse skill set includes certification in stress management, emotional intelligence, EFT tapping, and STAR, strategies for trauma awareness and resilience, allowing her to offer a comprehensive approach to personal and professional development. Are you new to any of these terms or just want to learn more about yourself? Then tune in and let's dive in. This guest expert is here to help. Welcome to the show, Letitia. It's great to have you on today. Thank you, Dawn. It is fantastic to be back. It is fantastic to have you back here and be with you. We are having a focus on guests with expertise on matters of the heart here in February. Mm. And that will help us take care of ourselves and our relationships in a variety of ways. What you have been able to do for me and others is truly remarkable. One of the things I value the most about our relationship, other than all the fun that we have. (laughs) (laughs) There's that. (laughs) Yes, there's that. But it is also how often we can have very meaningful, deep talks and conversations on so many topics, especially when it comes to healing ourselves. Mm. And you have quite the story Your amazing insights have impacted me about your own life journey and working with other people, the various trainings you've done. And I thought it would be amazing if we could see that side of yourself Mm. and bring that on to the podcast to share it with the laughers so we can provide some wisdom nuggets they may never have heard of that can help them. So I say we dig in. Let's go. Let's go. I want to ask first, could you share with us what inspired you to establish at the wheel coaching and focus on trauma informed coaching and consulting as a career? Sure. So I have uh, my my professional background. I was 20 years in insurance and I was an insurance claims professional. So I dealt mostly with car accidents. Um, People who were, you know, in an accident and never wanted to be in an accident. Nobody ever does. And so our goal as a claims professional is to help people get back at the wheel of their vehicles. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when I stumbled across my own journey and I say stumbled because I um, had some events happening in my life and really what was surfacing for me were these unhealed issues from the past. So on paper, I felt like I looked great. I had this, you know, you know, I've got this beautiful smile. Yes, she does. I do. I do. (laughs) So everybody sees that. But really what was happening is that I was crying myself to sleep at night, frankly, Mm. and I didn't understand it. And like just so many memories from the past were surfacing. So the long and the short of it is I started on this journey of understanding what that was and how something so old could still be producing pain in the present. Mm. And that's when I really learned about trauma and how unresolved harm histories can really impact us into our adulthood. And the more I got into that, not just as the journey of healing for myself, but like what tools were available. That's when I started saying, oh, my God, I can help people change this. I can help people shift this. I can't be the only person suffering. And I'm not. Mm -hmm. So I used all my vacation time to take trainings and get certified. (laughs) 
<laughs> really? I did. <laughs> so I wasn't going on trips anymore. I was just, everything was just training, training, training. And I did this for a few years. And then I said, this is what I need to do. And so my previous role was helping people get back at the wheel of their vehicles and in, at the wheel coaching. It's about helping people sit back at the wheel of their lives. I love how that comes full circle and yeah. ties in your past to your present. Yes. That's very symbolic. It's very important because the whole, and I think about the journey, the whole goal of insurance anyway, it's, it's this idea of indemnity, which is to make you whole. Mm -hmm. It's when something happens, it's how do you get back to your wholeness? And I really believe that people are whole and, and situations and circumstances come in and it impacts their ability to see their wholeness. So they may feel broken or they may feel fragmented, but I don't believe they are. I believe they're whole. Mm. And I believe helping them to see themselves as that and then healing that, you know, closing that gap of healing past whatever has happened to you to return you back to that wholeness. That's very interesting to me as someone who has a significant trauma history. I don't know we've work together and talked about this a little bit. I think it'd be helpful to break it down a little bit more for the laughers, more about what you just talked about. Someone who has gone through a lot mm. of trauma and we all kind of have recently. Um, how, how is a fragmented view of ourselves that, that we can see ourselves as fragmented or broken or in pieces because of these traumas? How does that, correlate to our whole self is still there how, yes. how do we how do we get reconcile there. that yes yeah, so it's a great question so i want you to think for a moment if you had a pair of glasses on right and they were broken yeah right just look there's a there's something in the lens that's a little shattered mm -hmm. the view outside is still whole Ah, right. It's just the lens good that you're looking through it that makes it look like it, it's fractured or that it's broken. I see. Now, here's another. I don't know if a laugher's thinking this, but I didn't think of it that way. When you said broken glasses, I was thinking, well, you can put those glasses back together, but you're still going to see all the places where it was broken. Or you can get new glasses. But the uh, point is that mm. the, the scene is whole. I got it. Right. The sun is still shining. The moon is still out or it's raining or it's snowing. The scene is still whole. It's perfect in whatever form. It's your perception of it based on the lens you're looking through. And when you've had trauma happen and there's no acknowledgement of that, there is no healing of that. Then you're going to look at the world through that broken lens. But you are whole. And so is the scene. That's beautiful right there. That is, I'm not really, that's an epiphany moment for me. <laughs> well, thank you. Laughers <laughs> is what she does. Okay. I'm going to, I know I'm going to have a million more questions. Okay, so let's it. get into another one here. Your certifications cover a range of areas, including stress management and emotional intelligence. How do these aspects intersect with trauma resilience and recovery in your coaching practice? So we're familiar. So let me just say this. I am a coach, not a counselor. Mm. But we've all heard this word PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome. It kind of gets thrown around and people don't know what it means. Essentially, the stress part of it is a chemical and physiological response to an external experience. Mm -hmm. Right. So we all think about a soldier who's gone to war, who's had these external circumstances around that around him or her mm -hmm. and. Then they come back to a place where the external circumstance no longer exists. But in their mind, the pictures and the images of that and the experiences of that still produces a stress response in the body. Mm. So understanding stress beyond I just have too many emails to read, right? Or too many phone calls to return. <laughs> yes, that is stressful. But People want me to pay my bills. <laughs> right. That part. <laughs> yes. All of that is totally stressed too. Right. Uh, totally valid. Uh, but what we're talking about is a physiological and chemical reaction that happens as a result of a stressor. That stressor could be something in the past, but in the mind, when you think about feelings, feelings are always felt in the present. 
If you think about how something made you feel yesterday, you can't go back to yesterday. You're feeling it now. Mm -hmm. If you're thinking about a speech you're going to give tomorrow and you feel nervous, you don't feel nervous tomorrow. You feel nervous now. So anytime an experience is putting a pressure on you internally, there is a stress response. It's physiological. It is chemical. So stress management is understanding what stress is. Right. It's a stimuli that's creating an internal response. When you have stress and you have something that you are fearing or something that has happened that you are afraid may happen again, that emotion is adding to the stress response. Mm. So the understanding of emotional intelligence, how people react in certain circumstances and situations, all of that's going to impact our relationships. It's going to impact our relationships at work. It's going to impact our relationships with friends. It's going to impact everything. Until we have an ability to understand our own sense of emotion and then tools to regulate that. Right. So the emotional intelligence is a key part of that in the stress management. How would you define emotional intelligence? If no one's, you're not really sure about the term or what it means. Yeah, so there are different ways of defining emotional intelligence in terms of how we see it in the business world. But what the way I think about it is the emotional response that generates the emotion that generates a response in you, positive or negative. Okay. Some people just think, well, I don't know when that person does that. It just it it just irritates me. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. You know, we all get irritated. But if something that somebody does makes you want to, I don't know, slash their tires, ah, there might be something behind that. <laughs> right? You think? You think, yes. <laughs> and that might be something worth investigating. We definitely don't recommend slashing no, tires here. No, we do not recommend Virginia's slashing tires. Laughers. No, it's for laughers, people. Yes. But <laughs> and we're not laughing at that. So no. don't be slashing tires, people. <laughs> but what it is, it's an invitation that if something is really upsetting you, mm-hmm. that would seemingly be normal and you really are having a strong response to it, that's a great opportunity to check in and see what is happening with you emotionally. And Mm -hmm. we're not taught to deal with our emotions. Mm -hmm. Right. So it, you know, asking the question, like what about that really sent me to fire? Like, why do I feel like rage around this? And in that investigation, we can understand, okay, this may have been coming from somewhere else. Something 10 years ago, something 10 years ago or somewhere in the past that could be triggering. Mm -hmm. And so that person's action may be reminding you of that. And this is happening at the subconscious level. The person might be reminding the person could be reminding you of it, because when you think about what happens in the mind and how memory is captured, you know, this is the human sensorium. Everything is visual, Mm -hmm. auditory, kinesthetic. There are either and there's smells and tastes. That's how we do everything as humans through that sensorium. So if a picture flashes in your mind of a time when something like that happened to you, maybe you were bullied, maybe you were attacked, maybe you've been serially ignored or abandoned or abused. And somebody does the slightest thing that reminds you of that, even at the subconscious level, you will have an emotional reaction to it. It's touching the wound. It is absolutely touching that wound. So I think about it this way, you know, if I'm driving down the street and somebody swerves into my lane and I get annoyed, well, of course I will be annoyed, right? Because you get, you're in fear. Mm -hmm. But if I drive off and like three hours later, I'm still upset or two days later, I'm still playing it over in my mind. That's an indication that something else is behind that. Right. Mm -hmm. So the, all of our emotions are valid. But when we feel like one emotion is really like driving us and it's not the one that's supporting our best lives, Mm -hmm. that's an invitation to see what's really behind that. And earlier you were talking about how these old wounds need to be basically seen, heard and validated. Yes. How does one go about doing that? Yeah, so that's a that's a great question. Um, the first thing that has to happen is you've got to bring validity to your own emotions. Mm. No one can do that for you. In my upbringing, you know, it's a classic story. My father wasn't present. He wasn't a part of my life. And he made a decision when I was about seven years old to exit. And it was, you know, it was painful. 
So the thing about abandonment or neglect that's so insidious, it's not like abuse where you can just point to a day where that happened or a time where that happened. Now I have abuse in my background as well, but that was something I could say this happened that time or, mm-hmm. you know, these experiences happened over the course of time. But the abandonment wound was just so intense. Mm. Um, and there wasn't just the moment, right? It was like this constant Every, absence. Yeah, he's not there. He's for not there. He's not there for homecoming and not there for the prom. Eighth right. grade graduation. All the stuff. Yeah. Right. And so I didn't understand how that was impacting me. Yeah. And we were just told, you know, you just get over it. Time heals all wounds and all this kind of stuff. And and that's not true. That's mm-hmm. not true. So what had to happen for me is I had to acknowledge that even though it had been years, 30 years later, I was still feeling pain from it. Mm. And if I were to share that with somebody, someone may say, well, you should get over that or you should be fine or look at the life you have now. But I knew all of those things and I still wasn't fine. Mm -hmm. So I had to say, all right, this is where I am and this is how this is showing up for me and this is important to me. And then I had to prioritize getting support and healing through that and not making it something that should be gone or happened a long time ago. No, it was surfacing for me then. You see, feelings of what happened to you have not been dealt with, named or identified so they don't feel validated, seen or heard. Right. And if it's something what we typically do, especially if it's old, we typically tell people they should get over it. Oh, we have. We have. That is a. And we point to people prevalent. who've had issues like them and talk about how they've gotten over it. Oh, that's nice. But this is what's active in me. And so the first person that has to really validate that is you. Mm-hmm. We're responsible for our own healing. Yep. No one else can do it for us. No. People can do it with us. Yes. And that's fantastic. Support is amazing. Yep. Speaking of which, when you are. Having stress and you're feeling out of control. You talked about how to regulate. So being out of control would be dysregulation. Yep. And being in a place where you can respond to those emotions where you feel out of control is when you need to regulate. Yes. What are some simple tips if no one's ever done that before that they could start today? Yeah. That would be helpful to them. So you know how people say count to 10 and you're like, what? Why would I be counting to 10? Well, that is a very simple way. And the reason is when your stress response is activated and you're just kind of like feeling all of this energy pulsing through your body, Mm -hmm. that really means that your prefrontal cortex, which is the part of your brain responsible for thinking, Mm -hmm. is just kind of not available to you. Mm -hmm. So you're like, you're not rational. It's offline. It's offline. You're not rational. You can't think. But when you start counting to 10, what that is actually doing is it's slowly pulling that free prefrontal cortex back on. So if you're doing one, two, three, four, five, your attention is being diverted to the count. And it's taking you out of that stress response. That's good. Depending how, you know, what the stressor is, and you can do this in your head, mm-hmm. right? So you're taking your attention and you're putting it on something logical And it's bringing, it's calming you down and regulating you. There's breathing techniques. There's tapping, which we can talk about later. There are different tools, but that count to 10, that's why that works. You start focusing on a logical sequence to bring your prefrontal cortex back on to help your body start to regulate. I like that a lot. A mindfulness technique that I found useful is along those lines where you breathe in for four, I count of four. You mm. hold the breath for a count of four and then you excel for a count of four. Yes. That's very similar. Yes, it is very similar. And it's, 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 and it's similar for, for, it's for the same reason. You are now focusing on that breath. Mm-hmm. So whatever the stressor is, your attention is now focusing on the breath. And that is helping to calm down the stress response that's being activated in your body. You have to understand when you have a, an emotion like fear or anxiety or um, panic, anger, anger. Oh, my God. Anger is one of the, the strongest ones. Um, it's a tertiary emotion, but we can talk about that if you want to. But anyway, <laughs> when you have those things, you have to understand that there are actual there's an actual 
physical and chemical release that is happening and flooding your bloodstream. It's flooding your nervous system. So it's not just, oh, you know, I feel afraid. No, there's a physicality to it. So the breathing is also a physical response. Mm -hmm. And it's bringing a level of consciousness to your breath that's helping with that regulation. Which is physiologically helping you because yes. it's calming down your nervous system and it's soothing. Yes. And it's yeah. interrupting the stress response. Which is really good. All right. Now we have to talk about it. This tertiary, uh, whatever you talk yeah, about. Yeah. <laughs> so anger. Yeah. So the thing about anger, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's tricky. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of energy to it. So this is the way, this is what I share with my clients. When you feel absolute total despair. It's mm -hmm. like laying on the floor, like, you know, you just you just can't get up. And I, I don't know about you, but I've had those days where I just can't just don't want to move. Right. That's despair. Mm -hmm. So a step up from that would be like anger and you're just kind of like standing up. Right. So you've got more you feel more empowered when you're standing than when you're laying on the floor. Right. Anger is a lot of energy. There's a lot of energy there. Yeah. But it's usually covering pain and hurt or yeah, and hurt and sadness, judgment, rejection. Mm. And so mm -hmm. when you're feeling those things, that's more like the despair stuff. And so if you don't want to lay on the floor anymore, you get angry mm -hmm. and you stand up. But it takes a lot of energy. So if you can understand that and just confront the anger, if anger, if you peel that back one layer it's going to be rejection. It's going to be hurt. It's going to be sadness. It's going to be something you don't want to feel. Mm -hmm. And so the anger kind of offers protection. Mm -hmm. Dismissed. Yes. Yeah. But it's so much energy. And if you are angry a lot or you find yourself constantly like flying off the handles, you'll get tired mm -hmm. because it's taking so much from so you. So much energy. I have a question. Is there a way to measure your emotional intelligence or is there a rating or do you self-rate? Yeah. So there are different assessments. And when I'm working, um, when I'm working with people, there are assessments that you can take to kind of see where you are on the mm -hmm. range. OK. Um, but when you're feeling emotions, you know, that's very subjective. And that's it's something it's actually called subjective units of distress. It's a SUDS unit. And you can just kind of sense for yourself to give yourself a baseline. If I were to judge this on a scale of one to 10, like how angry I am right now. Okay. Today it might be a 10. And then, right now turn Virginia's for laughers. Come on. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, but that's how you would do it. <laughs> oh, right? okay. This is an example. This is an example. This, okay. Yeah. And you would, the reason that you do it is you just want some baseline of knowing where you are. Okay. And so if you find, okay, I'm usually most days I'm at like an eight or a 10. That's an indication that you need some additional attention around what's happening with your anger. I see. If you think it's just your coworker constantly getting on your nerves, I'm going to tell you that stress response that's being activated in your body. That ain't happening in your coworker's body. <laughs> that's <laughs> happening in your body. Right? You're just called them out right there. I'm just saying. <laughs> so Susie might be getting on your nerves, but it's your nerves. <laughs> <laughs> you mean it's not Susie? It's not Susie. <laughs> <laughs> that's true mm -hmm. I, it reminds me of the joke that I tell sometimes that I read the book Feeling Good written by Dr. David Barnes Okay. and chapter 7 says the only person that can make you angry is you right right mm -hmm. and for the record Dr. David Barnes hasn't met my family <laughs> 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 right <laughs> or Susie apparently or Susie right because he doesn't know how these people are working your nerves but isn't it funny that we ah. say that they're on our nerves they're working our nerves ah. and they, it absolutely is that response the response you're having to their behavior right. is having an impact on your nervous system yeah yeah and I've heard too, there's a great podcast out there that I'm, and nobody's paying me to promote it, but it's really okay. good about this. <laughs> the adult chair. 
Mm. And it talks about how those moments when you are basically, I'm calling it wigging out, yep. that this is a healing opportunity for you to look within to see what you were talking about, take some time to self-reflect and figure out why that triggered you so much. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's very difficult to do it when you're in it. Yeah. Um, so this is why if you go with the breathing, if you use tapping, if you use the count um, to get yourself regulated, give yourself some distance from it, then it's much easier for you to go back to it and objectively look at it. Mm-hmm. If you're in the middle of a rage, you know, Susie does something and you're like, oh, my God, that's Susie. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> she always does this she always and she does always that. will. Right. <laughs> that's not the time to try to dissect that and understand what's happening. Mm. That's yeah. the time to like regulate yourself and say, all right, I am clearly upset here. Whatever right. just happened here, I'm feeling this. I'm feeling it so strong. My heart is racing. I'm feeling this in my stomach. I, you know, my back is like bolting up. Like there are usually physical sensations that are giving you an, an indication of where the anger or where the feeling, so to speak, is in your body. And so that's when you can say, all right, this is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to breathe, Let's breathe in, hold it for four, breathe out. Hold it for four, right? And just do that slowly, slowly, and intentionally until your body comes to a state You'll of feel calm. it. You will feel it. You will feel you it. You will feel it. And then, you know, a little bit later, you know, when you're not in the scenario with her anymore, you can then ask yourself, what about that made me feel that angry? Mm-hmm. And here's a good question. Where have I felt this before? Mm-hmm. And that's when evidence starts to show up Mm -hmm. you know i always feel this way when somebody you know makes me feel like i'm in a corner or when i feel i feel trapped feel Mm -hmm. trapped you know Mm -hmm. i grew up with this Mm -hmm. right and it can point to those places where somebody told you to get over it yes when you really just buried it and somebody telling you to get over it after a while that starts to get on your nerves too Mm. right because if you could get over Mm -hmm. it uh you would Right. Right. And so, so some things aren't just getting over. It's about how to get through them. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I was just, someone was texting me the other day and they're having a tough time and they were asking, how do I, how do I, how do I get over it? Yeah. And I said, the way over is through. Yeah. 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 The obstacle is the way. Yeah. And you mentioned tapping. I'm glad that you did because I want to talk about that. EFT tapping is a fascinating modality. First of all, what does EFT stand for? Let's let's start there. Yeah, it stands for emotional freedom techniques. Okay. And how does it work and what benefits have you observed in your clients who have incorporated it in their healing journey? So I will tell you that tapping is one of my favorite things. <laughs> I can vouch oh for this. <laughs> I love it so much. Um, but basically what it does, so remember when I was saying, when you feel fearful or anxious, that there's this physical, physiological response and that there are chemicals that are flooding your nervous system. Mm -hmm. What tapping does, you're taking, you're, you're taking two fingers and most of the points are on your face, Mm -hmm. but they're connected to your body's acupressure points. Okay. Yeah. And when you tap on these certain points. What you're doing is you're interrupting the stress response. Here's why. Let's say, for example, you feel a sense of anxiety in your stomach. You know, we talk about butterflies in the stomach when we get nervous, Mm -hmm. right? So there's a tapping point that actually connects to the meridian system that connects to your stomach. Mm -hmm. So when you're stressed, if a stress hormone is coming, you know, it's in your stomach and you can feel it there. When you tap on this point, it interrupts that stress response Mm. so that you're not getting physical chemicals that are going into the stomach and making you feel like those butterflies. You're actually it's bringing your body back to calm by tapping on these points. Mm. And so there are several different points. Um, You know, people use different protocols around tapping. I have a specific one that I use with my clients that's very effective. And what you're doing is you are. Um, 
you know, for people who've tried it before and they feel like, oh my God, it doesn't work. I will say that the secret to tapping, effective tapping is something that's called tuning. Okay. Talk about that a little bit more. Tuning is tuning into where that feeling is coming from. So we just go back to Susie, right? All right. And so if, for all the Susies out there, hey, no offense. This is not about you. <laughs> it's just a cool. I like easy how you quantified that. Yes. Right. So Susie, we just pulled Susie out of thin air. Yeah. Yeah. yeah she's just made her up. Okay. It would be especially fun if, a, if our name Susie's listening right now. We love you, Susie. We love you, Susie. We love all the Susies. <laughs> Okay. Uh, okay. So let's just say you are you're in the office. Right. And Susie walks in and you say good morning and she pretty much doesn't speak. Mm. Okay. And for some reason that just irritates you. Right. Then she comes back and she's, you know, wanting lots of attention for the thing that happened this weekend, but she's not speaking to anybody, she's just doing it. And so inside of yourself, you're thinking. This frickety frack, blah, 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 right? And you don't like it. You feel disrespected right. by it right. or whatever. There's usually some physical sensation attached to this. So Susie leaves the room and this is where you might feel that frustration, right? It might be in your chest. It might be in your head. It might be in your stomach. The tuning is noticing where it's located in your body. Mm, like, is it in your hips or is it in your shoulders? Is it in your foot? foot? Yeah. Right. And don't try to make it make sense. People be like, well, why is it in my stomach? And how come it doesn't make a difference? It's where the energy is focused. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you can tune in and know I am feeling this frustration in my stomach, that's where the power is mm -hmm. because your attention is where that energy is or where that emotion is. And then when you add tapping to it, you are tapping through the points. And the first thing you're doing is you're just acknowledging it. Mm -hmm. Right. And you tap through the points and you're saying something like, I have this feeling in my stomach and it feels frustrating. But you're doing this while you're tapping. It's releasing that stress response. It's interrupting it. So tuning into where it is and then adding the tapping is how you get the relief from it. Hmm. That whole thing about the triggering mm. that Susie puts upon us. Yes. <laughs> yes. Not specifically Susie. <laughs> Theoretically, yeah, Susie. Yeah. That, how, how do you, or what are your thoughts of the trigger in terms of us projecting what's happening inside of us on other people? Yeah. So that's a great question. And really, you know, it goes back to the glasses. It's all projection. Mm. You know, Susie's just walking in and maybe she's totally preoccupied with her weekend. Maybe she had a great weekend. Maybe she had a bad weekend. Maybe she's got stuff going on at home. We don't really know. Mm -hmm. But if she doesn't speak to us, the thing we might be saying to ourselves is she's ignoring us. She's being disrespectful. Mm. And anytime you're thinking along those lines, it's not positive emotions. Mm. So mm -hmm. everything is not the stressors aren't like the big. This is why the trauma thing is so important to me. Because there, are um, in this world of trauma, there are things called big T's and little T's, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and the big T's are the ones where your house burns down, right? Okay, we know that. Somebody gets into a really bad car accident. We know that. Somebody has an abuse background. We know that, right? But there are lots of other little things that happen, like someone disrespecting you. Mm -hmm. um, like someone saying something to you that embarrasses you in a meeting. Mm -hmm. Right. And these things are also activating stress responses in you when you are not feeling seen and you're not feeling heard when you're abandoned again, like that, that's one of the things that no one's doing something to you, right? There's no event to point to, but you're still having a stress response to it. So it's these little things that are happening and accumulating inside of us that also need our attention. Is the response to the little T's physiologically the same as a big T or? It, it can be. It can be. I mean, you know, there are people, you know, who somewhere in the third grade, somebody teased them about their legs. They felt completely humiliated because they had a pair of shorts on and they never wear shorts anymore. Mm. They only wear pants. Mm. And they'll say something like, um, oh, I'm not a shorts person. 
You know, oh, I don't like shorts. And what they're not doing, because it may have been so long ago, they may not even have a conscious connection to what made them stop wearing shorts. That's true. Because they could be 50 or... Yeah, and it's like, yeah, I just 40, don't wear that. I don't like dresses. And they don't know. Right. Like you, wear, you could have this beautiful dress on or, or a decent dress and somebody's just like, oh my God, that just looks horrible on you. And then the person becomes a pants person, you know, whatever. But these are how these things can take place. So they don't have to be these humongous things. They can be these little things that really can build and create other things inside of us. And then we are operating from those responses. Hmm. You have so many tools in your toolbox to help people. You also have a strategy or a a modality called STAR, and that is strategies for trauma awareness and resilience. Tell us more about what that is. Yeah, so I, uh, EMU, Eastern Mennonite University, is my alma mater. Oh, yes, yes. (laughs) And they actually have a training in this. And that's the training that I went through, uh, Strategies for Trauma Awareness and Resilience. Okay. So that's something, it's a, uh, a process that you can go through. And they help you to understand trauma at all these different levels, right? Because trauma happens at the individual level. Trauma happens at the family level. Mm-hmm. Trauma happens sometimes in a community level. We see this when we, you know, when we have a mass shooting, mm-hmm. right? And the whole community is rocked by it. Mm-hmm. Um, trauma can happen at the national level. Think about what happened back in um, September of 11, 2001, mm-hmm. right? So where you have something that a nation is really uh, affected by. And for the first time in my life, trauma happened at a global level. And that would be the pandemic when we all were like locked down. We couldn't go anywhere as an entire world. Mm -hmm. So it's helping to. For you to understand what that trauma might be for you and how it is impacting you and then having strategies for you to operate in a sense of resilience. But you have to be aware. Mm. The key is awareness. It is. I I actually just came back from a therapy appointment today. Yeah? Yeah. And talking about how some people will go their entire lives and not really be aware. Right. And let's face it. I mean, (laughs) this stuff can be tough. Yeah. And sometimes if you've gone through a really tumultuous time, especially your childhood, you don't want to look back. Mm -hmm. I mean, I get it. I told I I get it. She does get it. I have lived some crazy stuff. You have lived some crazy I stuff. I have lived some crazy stuff. And at some of it I would just, you know, so I I never judge anybody who doesn't want to do, you know, to do this work of excavating. Yeah. Um but I will tell you it it is a reward. It is very rewarding because when you're able to go to to Go through a process to help yourself heal from that. Mm -hmm. It's a reclamation. Mm, Tell me more. So it's like, what's, what's a, okay, I'm going to use a horrible analogy. Um, but I, I'll, I'll admit that it's horrible. Is Susie involved? No, Susie, no, there's no Susie. This time. <laughs> Susie gets a pass on this one. Okay. Right? <laughs> but it's like a part of you that's, that is like reserved for something else. Yeah. Right. So here's the horrible analogy. Let's say you have a car payment. Right. And let's say your car payment is $500 a month. Mm-hmm. Right. And so you're paying this car payment, paying this car payment, paying this car payment. It's like, a part of your income, no matter what you do, is always going to be diverted to that mm. payment. But when you pay the car off, what happens to the five hundred dollars? Yeah, what happens to that? You get it back. You can do whatever you want That's with it. Right. Right. So if parts of your past where you just I can't think about this, I don't want to deal with the memories of that. That's just like a lot of energy that's just taking from you, taking mm. from you, taking from you. But if you can revisit some of that and release the pain that is still connected to that, it's like getting that part of yourself back. Oh, I like that. And when you get that part of yourself back, when you are in that that reclamation, you can do whatever you want with that. You can take that energy and you can put it toward a new future. Right. There's so much that can be done. Mm -hmm. So there's the value. There's the incentive for it. And here is one other thing I will say that I have found really fascinating. I 
um, in the beginning, for whatever reason, I had a lot of clients that came to me that were older. Mm -hmm. So these are people who were in their 60s, had had very, very successful careers. And they got into retirement. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the things that were that had happened to them when they were kids started surfacing Mm. and they didn't know what to do with it. And the more I was working with them to like, you know, work through those things again, I'm not a counselor, I'm a coach. And the real big difference in my mind is I'm not really there to help you learn about what happened. I'm help there to help you move forward. Mm -hmm. So I think of a counselor as more like, um, an archaeologist, right? It's kind of right. let's dig past. into it, figure out because everything's connected, right? And how to ha- have it be seen and heard and integrate it. Yes, yeah. But I think of myself as more an architect. Ah, so it means you want to go somewhere, but something. So you've got to deal with where you are right now, mm-hmm. and then when you get ready to put that plan forward to move to where you want to go, the reasons why you think you can't do it surface. <laughs> I don't just, have enough money. I, I don't do have this. enough time. I'm not good enough. I'm yeah. not smart enough. Yeah. I'm dumb that I'll never mount these things, right? People that's think what, I'm crazy. Right. Yeah. So that stuff starts to surface mm-hmm. and that's where I can come in and help. So what did these people want? You know, once they're in their 60s and they've had their careers, they want peace. They want to um to enjoy their lives Mm -hmm. and they don't want to be besieged by memories and events that happened long ago. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the people, you know, were passed away. So there was no way for them to go Uh to the person and have the person, you know, acknowledge any of those things. So Mm -hmm. we were able to deal with a lot of those things, but it really incentivized me to say, okay, whatever is showing up, I got to handle it because I can't necessarily outlive it. Mm. That's so good. That's some good food for thought right there. Speaking of food for thought, (laughs) I brought you some absurdly flavorful gourmet popcorn from our sponsor, Pre Popsterous. Okay. So we can munch on it while we dig on some more deep thoughts. Mm. Are you familiar with Shenandoah Valley's only award winning popcorn? Yeah, but I've never had this flavor. Oh, what did you got? Oh, goodness. What is it called? Mm, I think it's Windy City Mix. Yeah. Mm. So it's got the cheddar mm-hmm. and the caramel. Oh my goodness. It's so good. It has a lot of salty flavors, sweet flavors, and then sometimes she mixes it up. Mm. Mm-hmm. This is my favorite. It's delicious. I brought you another bag too. Mm. Okay. <laughs> it's your lucky day. Yes. <laughs> Laughers, their kernels are grown right here in the valley, and their factory is 100% nut free. It's a perfect gift for any occasion, birthdays, anniversaries, literally anything you can think of. Plus, Laughers get a 15% discount when they use promo code LAUGH15. So get that promo code out and visit prepopsterous.com today. That's P-R-E-P-O-P-S-T-E-R-O-U-S.com. Use that code and get some of this delicious popcorn. Mm. Mm. I'm back to you, Letitia. I know you were talking about working with older clients, but what would you say your age range of clients uh, is now? It's when I'm doing the one-on-one work with, with groups, it's usually between the ages of 35 and 45. Mm. Mm-hmm. Okay. And it's, it's interesting enough, that's when, that's when my stuff started happening. Really? Yeah. Yeah. What actually happened was I was 37. I was going into my 38th birthday, and I had this friend, um, and she... I mean, she was amazing. Her name is Kate. She's since passed, but Mm -hmm. oh my God, what an amazing, amazing mentor. And we met three years earlier and, you know, just getting to know people and, um, and she was like a mother figure. And so I would just kind of sharing things to her kind of, you know, and just frustrations around things that had happened to me when I was growing up. And, you know, I I had, I've had abuse. I've had sexual abuse in my background. Mm -hmm. I've had the abandonment of the father. There's a lot. You know, a lot of traumatic deaths. I mean, just a lot of things. And so I would share some things with her and she would say to me, well, Letitia, that's that's trauma. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, no, trauma is when your house burns down. You know what I mean? Like I just had this big um, 
thought about it being these big catastrophic things. One of your loved ones was in 9-11 or yeah. in Hurricane Katrina. Yeah. yeah. That's that's trauma, right? Mm. It You know, it's not me. It's not this. And, you know, that's the other thing about the, the nature of this is if you've lived with something for a long time, there's this normalizing it. Mm. You think it's you. It's think it's how you deal with things or how things are. So it's like you don't even recognize that this is not a normal way of being, Mm -hmm. you know, tolerating or being in an abusive relationship. That's not normal. That's not Mm -hmm. safe. Right. Um, So anyway, she would say this to me, you know, Letitia, that's that's trauma. Mm -hmm. And so she was skilled um, at another modality called EMDR. Mm hmm. I movement. I've done some of that. Yeah. So the acronym for that is I movement desensitizing reprocessing. Mm-hmm. And basically it's a modality to help regulate your nervous system from past memories. It's similar to EFT. It's not the same thing. They're different protocols, different disciplines, but they have the same goal mm-hmm. of pulling you fully into your present, resolving traumatic memories or upsetting memories mm-hmm. and resolving uh, the emotional distress from the past or anything that you might be projecting on your future. There are people who have, you know, a fear of speaking. Mm -hmm. Right. And they're projecting fears. Mm -hmm. So this helps with that too. So anyway, so I was about to turn 38 and I had had one of these moments where I'd cried myself to sleep and I woke up the next day and I thought to myself, there is no way I'm going to be able to heal everything I need to heal in the next couple of years, I was going to turn 40. Mm -hmm. Right. And I was like, but I cannot take this stuff into my Mm forties. Like, I'm just not going to do it. So I'm not going to be able to do it overnight. Mm -mm. So I'm going to start now. And I literally picked the phone up, called Kate. And I said, you've been telling me about this. What do I need to do? Mm -hmm. And at the time she lived in Charlottesville and I live in Harrisonburg. It's about an hour distance. And so all of the practitioners that she knew lived in Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. And so she gave me the name and I called and for two years Mm. I drove over the mountain. Mm. I was, it was so effective, but here's the really weird thing that happened. Okay. And this is how I got into coaching. So all of a sudden things start shifting and I'm feeling better, but I found myself in like an identity crisis. Really? I had felt so identified with being a victim of these experiences. Oh, okay, I'm going to listen first and I have some thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I knew that, you know, I grew up without the father and it wasn't like, I, I never walked around with a woe is me kind of story, mm. but I had that feeling like I had been victim and cheated, right? Mm-hmm. Like, why, you know, why don't I have this? And how come I had to deal with this? And why was this my struggle? And how come I got this abuse and I'm a good person and all the stuff. But as this stuff was healing and shifting, I'm like, I don't, feel like a victim of abuse anymore so that's why when you hear me talk about it i'll say i I have abuse in my history in your background in my background Mm -hmm. it it doesn't feel like a part of me Mm -hmm. but what does that mean like who am i now Mm -hmm. and that's when i found coaching Mm -hmm. because i'm like okay i have to figure out how i'm gonna construct the (laughs) i don't know the rest of my life Mm -hmm. and so the coach was helping me Focus on what do I want? What do I want to do? What Mm -hmm. is possible for me? Because new possibilities were also opening up in in my mind. Mm -hmm. And when I started to see those possibilities, I'm like, you know what? I need more of this. And that's when all of my reading started to change. And I started going deep into what these changes could be and how I could be of service to other people in this way. Mm -hmm. And that's where for a couple of years after that, I didn't have vacation time. I just took all the vacation time and just did (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> what certification can I get now yeah, can I, what can I, do? I can do this oh my god there are more levels yay <laughs> and so I would take Thursday through um, Monday and I would take week longs or whatever it took mm-hmm. um, and that's how I launched the, the coaching practice yeah that's amazing very inspirational too I like how you talked about the victim mindset not that being a victim is likable it's a reality for people that have been through trauma. They, in the moment it happened, they are the victim. And an after effect or aftermath of that is you can 
have a, basically a stuck loop, mental loop, where you're thinking that way, you yeah. know, because of what happened to you. And again, the way over is through. Yes. To acknowledge what did happen to you, to be able to name it, to identify it. But now you're at the wheel. Yes. You're in the driver's seat. Yes. It's not happening to you anymore. You're okay in this moment. And now you get to choose. Yes. But here's the thing about victimhood that is not popular, but I'm going to say it. Okay. Get to victimhood. Mm -hmm. Whatever you've got to do, please be a victim. Mm -hmm. Here's why that is so important. If you never get to victimhood, you never understand that what was done to you was wrong mm. and bad and not okay. You will repeat it. Oh, that is such a good point. You will. That is a thing. You, you will, will keep, live. You will keep repeat. Keep, you'll recreate, recreate it. it. You'll keep living from the because your your brain is trying to solve it. Yes, it's trying to solve. Hey, why did we get here? And your brain thinks it's normal. Yeah. Yeah, that's why people that come from an abusive background can get involved in abusive relationships yes. on a romantic level. Yes. Because that was normalized to them. Absolutely. In their childhood. Yes. And it feels familiar. Yes. They know what to do. And anything outside of that, as crazy as it sounds, is scary because yes. it's an unknown. It is. And remember when I was talking about this physiological response? Right. Um, these chemicals. It's mm -hmm. like it's a rush. Of, you know, we talk about when you're like running from something that there's an adrenaline rush. Right. Well, there is there's a rush to your body mm -hmm. and your body becomes familiar with being in environments that create that. Mm -hmm. So if you never get to a place where what has happened is is not OK, it's it's wrong. It's bad. If you never get that moment of the victimhood. That's the possibility. It's just running into these loops and into these relationships that recreate the victimization. But if you can say this was absolutely unequivocally wrong, bad, hurtful, and I was a victim for that time and then do the work around healing. That's right. That's when that those possibilities start opening. That's where you get the reclamation process, right? That's where mm -hmm. you can reclaim the parts of you who've, who've had to live through that and move forward in your life in a different way. So I say, if you've been dealing with something, some relationship or something that continues to surface in your life and you don't like it, your first step is getting to victim. Yes. And if you're listening, you could be somebody that you've noticed that each of your romantic partners have similar attributes. Yes. That end up in the same result. This could be a flag for you to look at that and go, what in the world am I doing? Where what? have I felt this before? Yeah. Yeah. How come each person that I choose ends up ending the same way? Yes. And then you, you, cause inside you, you'll use language like this always happens to me. Yeah. Or I'm always having to do this or men do this or women do this. Yes. Yeah. Right. And so it gets generalized and you think that this is how people behave. Mm -hmm. But it 9.999. Nine nine <laughs> times out of ten. <laughs> so many nines in there. So many nines. But Susie got a break. Yeah, Susie got a break this time. <laughs> <laughs> but by and large, those things uh, have happened because something happened so much earlier. Yeah, that has never really been addressed. I learned something recently while we're talking about this victim mindset that I did want to talk to you about. Okay. So here we are. Here I'm going to ask Let's you about it. I was learning not too long ago that scarcity mindset and victimhood are connected. Yes. And I want to hear your expertise and your thoughts about the connection and why that's connected. And Yeah. So scarcity mindset is really like a lack mindset. Mm -hmm. Like you're not, you don't have enough. You don't have enough of this. Um, you don't get enough. There are not enough opportunities. Like it's, it's a real like lack. Mm -hmm. Like there's an absence of something. And so what happens in a victim experience with the absence is there's an absence of safety. Mm. Right. And so there's uh, there's a lack of comfort. Mm -hmm. Right. Because you're never you're safe. You're on a defense. And so, for example, in my abuse experience, I was like constantly on alert when I was around this particular person 
um, who was a friend of our family. Mm. And so I'm young and I won't go into all of the details, but it was one of those, you know, like you can't tell anybody kind of things. And I'm just kind of locked in this, you know, experience and I don't know how to get out. I'm, I'm trapped. So there's a lack of safety. So being in the room with people that you love and having this person be in that room too, you're still not safe because mm-hmm. you don't know what's going to happen and how it's going to happen. Right. Mm-hmm. So that lack of safety and security creates that sense of scarcity. Scarcity. Ah, it's all connected. It is very connected. Wow. And as we go, you know, when, when, you know, let's just go back to Susie really quick. Okay. Um, all right. <laughs> um, but when you think about it though, so that thing, you know, that whatever behavior that that person does, Susie does that activates something in you, you may not have a conscious memory of it. Mm-hmm. Right. It might, it, it's just, you just know that it just, there's something and we'll say it's just something about her. I don't like. Right. Mm-hmm. And we don't necessarily know what it is. But it's typically tied to something that has happened in the past. That's so interesting. The the self-reflection and self-awareness, the more we do that, the more we can find the answers to our own questions. Yeah. And think about the way the mind works. The mind works really through association. Mm -hmm. So always think about like McDonald's. Like if you see the golden, if you've you've ever been on a trip and you've had to use the bathroom Mm -hmm. and you're like, oh my God, and you see the golden arches, like suddenly you're, you know, you can go to the bathroom, Mm -hmm. but you also know there's a burger in there and there's shakes in there and there are fries. And how do you know? Because you've associated that emblem or that, that symbol with all of those things. Mm -hmm. Because you've had an experience of all of those things with that, uh, that emblem or that icon. Right. You know it. That you know it because there's an association. there. Mm. Let's talk about trauma resilience. How do you define this term? So the resilience really is, you know, there's a there's a uh, a process or a three step thought process that I take my clients through. And one of them, it's called ACT. Mm -hmm. Right. So A-C-T. So the first thing to do is acknowledge. You have to acknowledge what's actually happened, which is a hard part. Um, But the second is that C and it's cultivating compassion for Mm -hmm. yourself. And what I have found is that people who've had the histories like I'm talking about, it, it, they have a hard time with self-compassion. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. And really cultivating that self-compassion. Right. So if you can acknowledge what's happened and you can have compassion for the part of you that has actually gone through it, then you can get to the T, which is transformation. Mm. So to me, that resilience is an acknowledgement that this has happened. I am feeling compassion about the part of me that has lived through this. And now I'm able to transform it. That's resilience. What a lot of people try to do is skip the C. They mm-hmm. skip the, the A, right? They just want to, like, I don't want to feel this anymore. They just want to go straight to the T. I want to be all better now. Right, I want to be better right Stop now. Stop doing anything. I don't anything. Do anymore. Right. <laughs> I'm in an instant gratification society. What do you mean I have to do something? <laughs> Yes. And so (laughs) resilience to me is all of it. It's I've acknowledged it. I've got compassion for myself and the part of me that's had to live through it. And now I've got some tools. And so we've talked about several tools today and I'm going to use these tools to transform. Mm. The trauma is so many terms and trauma. I see there's a term called secondary trauma, too. What is what is that? Yeah. So secondary trauma. um, And this happens when you. I've dealt with this when I when I've worked with agencies for okay. people who are listening to traumatic stories. Oh, wow. Long. That's right. I didn't even think about it from that angle. So they it, it might be a social worker. Right. And they are sitting there and they are having to hear. It could be a counselor, it could be a mm-hmm. therapist who's hearing it. Right. And they're hearing the horror stories or mm-hmm. they're hearing these stories or, of abuse or it could be an attorney. Mm-hmm. I remember. Um, I went, actually went to a retreat. Really interesting. I went to a retreat and um, there was this woman who had come from the retreat and she had just left Texas. This was a couple of years ago. And this is when, this is when babies were being separated from their families at the border. Mm. And she was there watching it. Mm-hmm. Like, and so when she came back, she could hear the screams of the parents and she could hear the cries of the baby. Like she couldn't get it out of her head. 
Mm-hmm. And she had come to the retreat for some for some reprieve. So that's an experience of secondary trauma because she was not physically impacted by that, mm-hmm. but she was a witness to it. Mm-hmm. So you can be a physical witness to it and it's still going to activate that stress response in your body. Or you could be just constantly inundated with the stories. Right. Mm-hmm. And this is why the news can be such a challenge mm-hmm. because we don't understand that, you know, when we say, you know, my heart goes out to that person or my heart is just, is just tore my heart out watching that or listening to that. We're having the physiological response to it. That secondary trauma or vicarious trauma. Both of those terms are used energy. And what do we do in those situations similar to addressing our own triggers? And- yeah, very similar because, um, you know, it's it's just like the person getting like on your nerves. It's happening in your body's nervous system. Mm. So you can use the same tools to bring yourself to a space of regulation. Mm. That's so important. As an executive coach, you also work with teams and organizations and businesses yep. with the unique challenges that leaders face in navigating trauma within their organizations. How do you support them in the process? So the coaching with the executive coaching, it could be, you know, again, the thing I love about coaching is you're ready to do something else. You're ready to go to some other level. You're ready to level up. You're ready to change your performance level, whatever the thing is. The only thing that stops you is anything from the past. Mm. It's not the future because the future hasn't happened yet. Mm. So when Mm -hmm. people are trying to level up and go to their next thing, all of the reasons why they think they can't do something start to surface. (laughs) <laughs> right <laughs> right yeah that darn brain's trying to protect us it's trying to protect us but it's wily you, yeah it is <laughs> it is but you've got teams yeah. who may have had you know things especially in this scenario you know this experience where really we're just back right in the last year from the pandemic people lost jobs they lost team members they lost productivity and so trying to recover from that and give the 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 um, co-workers And the teams, a sense of purpose, a sense of safety, helping with that and and helping people to become emotionally intelligent, emotionally intelligent around how they are relating to each other is really powerful in moving things forward. And we have some more big changes coming. They're already in place. We have robot technology and AI impacting the workplace. We do. And so people, you know, people whose livelihoods were around certain processes, you know, those, some of those jobs are just not going to come back. Yes. That's an interesting thing. We will lose jobs, I think, but new jobs, yeah, Yeah. well, new jobs will be created. So the resilience piece comes back. Well, Mm -hmm. you know, all right, I got to acknowledge what's happened. Um, If I've been sad about it or upset about it, I'm just going to have some compassion for myself. And then I'm going to do something to transform how I'm seeing this, how I'm approaching this, how I'm feeling. And then my level of resourcefulness comes on. Mm -hmm. And somebody's in that position, let's just say they see the writing on the wall for whatever industry they're in because of what's coming. What kind of advice would you give to them in terms of resourcefulness? So the first thing that is going to typically happen with that person is they're going to feel a a sense of fear, a Mm -hmm. sense of anxiety. Mm -hmm. Right. And this goes back to the tuning. Mm. So that fear and that anxiety is located somewhere in your body. Mm hmm. And so tuning into that and using the techniques that we've talked about, whether it's a tapping technique or whether it's a breathing, whether and just start calming yourself down. Once your body is calm and you're in a calm state, then your resourcefulness kicks in. Then you can start to say, all right, you know what? This thing is happening. Let me just Google this uh, chat GPT thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Let me learn about it. What you might find is you could be the go-to person of how to take the business through an AI transformation. But Mm -hmm. you're not resourceful when you're in fear. You're not resourceful when you're in anxiety. So if you can resolve those inner conflicts first and then say, all right, well, what's available to me? Because, I mean, think about it. Right now, everything that has ever been known to man is available at our fingertips right now. Right? Really? Like, we're living in a wild time. We are living I'm in sure a wild someone a hundred years from now is going to say, what? they thought they were in a wild time. Look at us we're now. We're in a wild time. But at the moment, in yes. the present, we are living in a wild, in a wild time. time. Yeah. But that's the opportunity for you to say, all right, what's next for me? Yeah. And maybe the thing I've always wanted to do, maybe it's time for me to do that now. Mm. Um, maybe I need to get some training. Maybe I need to take all my vacation time 
and start getting certified <laughs> and become a coach. <laughs> Maybe I'll become a coach. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, that's how I would deal with that. I would deal with whatever surfacing for you and then opening up the resilience and the resourcefulness. Yeah. You can't really operate out of the panic button. It's hard. It's hard. I mean, we, a lot of us do it. We do it in survival mode. It's, it's just hard. Survival mode. Yep. That's absolutely correct. Where we're reacting, not responding. Yep. And that makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, world. What advice would you offer to individuals or organizations seeking to prioritize trauma awareness and resilience in their personal and professional lives? Yeah. So I think, you know, sometimes people have, and this gets a little tricky at work because sometimes people have what they call problem employees. Susie. <laughs> <laughs> let's just keep rolling with Susie okay uh, yeah uh, this well, podcast is dedicated to all the Susies all the out Susie. there <laughs> <laughs> well I would say if you are recognizing that something is happening I mean there there are still programs called e, like EAP employee assistance program oh great yeah yeah when you recognize it because it could be that a, an employee has been fine and then all of a sudden they're not fine and so having the conversation with them, it may be just like way too personal, but having resources available to them, you know, there are, there are companies who are, who hire coaches to support their team. And so what happens in some of the coaching sessions, well, if I'm in an executive coaching session, that information is confidential. If I'm mm -hmm. in a group, it's a different thing. But if I'm in an executive coaching scenario, that is that that's different. And some of that is could be performance based. So really, as an organization, it's having resources available for your team, for your employees and for your team members to be able to go to, because it's not appropriate for you to try and, uh, you know, dismantle whatever their issue is mm -hmm. as their employer. But it is your um, it behooves you to look and to see that this person may be having a difficult time and having some resources available for that person. Mm. And then for the individuals, how do they prioritize trauma awareness and resilience in their lives? I think what you, I think what you feel matters, mm. mm -hmm. but you have to validate that. And if you're the one telling yourself, this is old, I should be over this. This has happened too many times or whatever. And you're feeling, whatever you're feeling about it, you owe it to yourself to validate that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if we have something that we feel like we just had, we've just been dealing with it for a long time or dealing with it over and over and over again, shame creeps up. Oh, yeah. Right. And shame is just it's one of the most crippling emotions there. Isn't it Brian Brown? Brian. Brene. Brene. Brene Brown. Brene Brown oh, yeah. is a great person. She's amazing. To look up. Yeah. About shame. Yeah. She's got great books and TED Talks, I think. And But it's one of those things that will keep you. Um, from moving forward and getting help. Mm -hmm. You just don't want to admit this has happened, that this has been a part of your experience. Um, maybe it's a mistake you feel like you keep making. Mm -hmm. And so you're doing something internally that make yourself feel stupid or dumb or undeserving. I mean, all of those things will stop you, slow you down or hold you back. Mm -hmm. You're stuck in a pattern. Yep. So you have to interrupt the pattern. And you just got to know. I, I mean, all mm -hmm. you have to do is know I don't like it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so you got to do. I don't like it. And I don't want to, I don't want to deal with it anymore. I don't want to do it this way anymore. Yeah. Right. And just that acknowledgement can move you into a different direction to make a different choice. Mm, with a whole new set of lenses. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that's a good note to wrap on, wrap up on. So how best can the laughers get in touch with you, Letitia? Well, I offer a complimentary clarity session. Okay. So you can find me at chatwithleticia.com and um, read through the website and click on the button, book a session, and let's see how I might be able to help. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Leticia. This has been incredibly insightful and so fun chatting with you about all things on how changing our mindset transforms our ability to problem solve with you at The Wheel Coaching. Thank you for sharing your expertise with us and for coming on the show today. As always, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. You bet. And laughers to learn more about what At The Wheel Coaching and Letitia can do for you and claim that free clarity session, please visit chatwithletitia.com. 
That's chat with Letitia, L-E-T-I-T-I-A dot com. And go there today. Also, don't forget that discount on pre using promo code LAUGH15 at prepopsterous.com. That way you can munch on it when you join me on next week's episode. And lastly, and most importantly, thanks for tuning in, laughers. Out of all the podcasts out there, you picked us, and we think that's pretty darn special, just like you. Until next time, keep smiling. Bye. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Virginia is for Laughers podcast brought to you by X2 Comedy. We'll be dropping a new podcast every Wednesday. So check back for another uplifting episode. Come to an X2 Comedy show or let us bring one to you. To find out more, head to X2Comedy.com. Be sure to share this podcast with a friend. And until next time, cheers. Cheers.